Welcome into the 192nd episode of the Young Terps podcast, joined by an old Terp tonight, Wayne uh, Viner hopping on the show with us. Wayne, thanks for joining us. It's been a rough couple of days for the Terps. Oh, man, it, it has been. From the women's basketball, the men's basketball, it has not been good, Mason. No, it hasn't, but, you know, I, I think there's one thing that we can always say in Maryland, which is, thank God, lacrosse season is coming. Yeah, in a few days, on the, <clears throat> is it the 5th? Let's get started up with a home game. Yeah, practice getting kicked off around the country when it comes to lacrosse season. Uh, a little bit easier down here in Florida to uh, have some lacrosse weather than up in Maryland, where what's the um, low tomorrow is like 10 degrees. Yeah, it's supposed to be three to five inches of snow here, and we're in this lull between the Michigan game. You see behind me an image from back when Cowan played, and the, the Terps are competitive in these games. And then tomorrow night, it's Illinois on a Friday night. So yeah, I'm looking forward to several lacrosse opportunities to get out there and see some some winning games. Yeah, and we have not seen much of those. The Terps uh, continue the slide through Big Ten play. And at this point, it's hard to say that there's much left to watch. What are your kind of thoughts on, um, you know, the attendance has been bad. I'm sure the TV viewership isn't great. And a Friday night game against Illinois, even though the Illini are ranked, I I still can't really see it being much of a draw. No, traffic. That's all you got to say around the D.C. College Park area is traffic. It's going to be a long slog from Baltimore, 7 o'clock on a Friday. Uh, I'm trying to get out there at 5 to sort of – just to beat the traffic. It's not beating the rush to the game. Mm-hmm. So there hasn't been that much good that's happened. But i got to ask you about one thing. I was on the way to the game on Saturday against Rutgers. And I go through my Twitter feed, and I see one of the – best things I've seen on Twitter, which was reading the best of the Big Ten. And they put out a list of the best podcasts. And I read down the list, and uh, you won. You won the yeah, best show, of the Big Ten. This show did get acknowledged by a Twitter account that doesn't have too many followers. But, you know, it's it's good to see that people do realize. And we know that we have listeners, and it's not really, you know, that that – huge I think at least to me because this podcast has been acknowledged over time but you know first off thanks to everybody that listens to the show that that's what makes it recognizable and second is between yourself Bruce me Jordan Jack Todd you know the list goes on and on of contributors that we've had to this all the people we've interviewed that have taken the time guys like Jeff Baxter they've made a really really strong passion-driven Maryland brand. And and that's something that Jordan and I set out to do when we made the show. That's what we wanted to bring to this is that when we started the show, you know, I was, what, 16, uh, maybe 15 when we actually first started it. We started out on a trip in Florida. Then Jordan and I went around, basically around the world. We went to Greece, Israel. We talked about the Maryland players and the you know, European Basketball League, and that caught a lot of eyes. Jordan did something about, you know, where are they now stories on Maryland players that played in Europe that did brought our show some attention that we were able to talk about. And it was just a matter of we didn't really, and we've said this constantly for all of our longtime listeners at every milestone episode, we didn't think this would really go anywhere. You know, Jordan and I sat down on my iPhone and did a show. It was was called the Terp Talk Podcast, I think, when we first started it. That's a good name. And and from kind of there on out, we just figured out between the two of us, Jordan is now in sports information. Myself and Ned does stuff with, you know, the school that I've gone to and I've been on TV and all, all kinds of stuff through this avenue. But this really was what we envisioned when we started out was to really for it to be a fan-driven show that covered all of Maryland sports. And we've gone away from that and gone back to it as the show's gone on. We've done more interview-based stuff, and, and recently we've kind of fallen off, which is why we're doing this episode tonight and going to start doing some more short-form podcasts, your 7 to 15 minutes, just uh, really on a topic, whether it's on these basketball games that go by you know, every other day or every couple days, or when there's football news to break. We're going to turn this more into a 
a breaking news podcast where we still go in depth, still have interviews, still do some long form episodes, but just to get you guys the Terps content that I know you look for from the show to continue to be ranked number one by different sources when it comes to Maryland sports media. We're going to change it up the way that we're doing to kind of fit into uh, everyone's schedules and give you guys episodes that don't take 45 minutes to listen to. And it's going to involve more of you, Wayne. It's going to involve more of Jack doing some solo stuff for us. And then, uh, of course, bringing it back around to, I guess, me, who's now the the founder of the podcast. Uh, Jordan, credit where credit's due, but he's not, he's not here anymore. It's kind of changed the whole dynamic of the show. Network solutions, managed IT, and technical support. Viner Forgates makes your company work. Solutions to protect your business from WatchGuard, including firewalls and endpoint protection. Protect your company and make your company work with solutions from Viner Forgates. It does. We need to bring those arguments back. I think that's people like to listen to that. I remember going to the studio with you when we used to do radio shows from a studio, which is, God, that's years ago. And you said that you wanted to develop your own voice. I said, yeah, I think you're ready. Then you started a podcast. Mm-hmm. And and here we are. Well, the, I think the funniest story from starting it is um, I, I told Jordan that I was going to start a podcast. And he said, yeah, like, good luck with who? And I said, well, with you. And he said, oh, well, then we should do the show. And yeah. it, it kind of went with that that rhythm of it the entire way when he was doing the podcast. And then You know, like you said, there were a lot of good arguments on there, and we're going to look to kind of bring that back, make this show, you know, back into the the image that it was built in with the consistent episodes and the banter about Maryland sports that that went with it. Right. Well, Jordan Jordan was great. I hope one day I sort of prohibited from doing this because he's in the business now on the NCAA side. But uh, he'll be back when the time is right. But for right now, it's strange to look at a, a kid who's, 23 and go, I don't know, those are pretty big shoes to fill to, to do what Jordan did, which is bring a very passionate, almost counter argument. His take that no matter what they did, it wasn't going to work. And he's been a Terp fan his whole life. And all this is is pain and abuse. My goodness, this is his moment. Yeah, this really is his moment. Jordan was never a big Mark Turgeon guy. And and again, the people that listen to the show, that definitely was out there. This is, you know, and and this kind of brings us into the game from last night. This is what a lot of people, I think, including almost everybody within the Terp Talk brand, wanted. They wanted Maryland to move on from Mark Turgeon. Not exactly in the way that it happened. I don't think any of us were looking for that. But... Here we are now, one and six in the conference. A lot of, or one of, really the games, maybe a couple of the games that were supposed to win are out of the way. And it was another classic Turgeon era, just beat down, seemingly in the cold, but that doesn't really matter because, well, the game's played inside, uh, by one of the Michigan teams in mid-January or February. It was a game, really, a lot of people said it was awful. It's the worst they've seen them play. I went back and I looked at the game, and and if you look at it year over year, we've seen a game like this every year on a rolling basis, even when Maryland was, you know, number two in the country. Okay, so in the spirit of this stepping in for Jordan, oh, my God, they stopped playing defense. I, I can't believe the lack of defensive integrity they had. I would have benched all of them. Uh, it It's just... Well, well, that's, that's where you and I, I think, are the same on this, is at some point, especially in the first half when the offense had absolutely nothing and they kind of had given up on defense, you got to be looking down the bench. You How know, bad can those guys be to not put them see, in? And I think that's something that when people mention that the Maryland media doesn't really ask pressing questions, I, I think that's one of them right up the alley is, look – you changed the lineup. You went out of your way to put different guys, try and plug something in, which absolutely did not work. What is stopping the guys near the end of the bench that are on scholarship, that aren't walk-ons? You know, the walk-ons are in a different category. But guys like, you know, Simon well, Wright and Dockery and some of these guys that, you know, they've played. But Pavel Zubia, number 12, who transferred in. 
yeah, like this this isn't going anywhere. They they were clearly not going to win that game without some absolute fire starter run from out of nowhere, which they've come up with a couple throughout the years. So they haven't been able to finish them this year. But it just it doesn't work. What they're doing simply at this point does not work. Wahab has, I think, been figured out by this league. He, he just there's a reason why he was in the transfer portal. And look, I know Bruce brings this point up all the time. When this transfer portal first thing first started, I said in the major sports, there's a reason why you transfer because you will be a god at the school that you are successful at if you play football or basketball. And I think people were really bought into this idea of this transfer portal. But at the end of the day, if a school is begging you to stay at a place, more than likely you're going to stay. There are exceptions to that. But in general, major school to major school transfers are not successful. And you brought this up a lot more in the football portal when somebody said we're going to go out and somebody's going to get a quarterback. And you said just doesn't really work. There's very few exceptions. Maybe Jalen Hurts. Leah had to actually become the quarterback he is. Yeah, he transferred from Alabama to Maryland. But he, the period between November and that bowl game, mm. I think that football team got a lot better. But that's a different topic. But I, I, think I don't know. In basketball, when you look at it, People say that you don't need what you need in football and basketball. That if you get the best players, you'll be successful. Well, I think Maryland is in the bucket that Kentucky has been in. You know, Coach Cal's going to go out there. He's going to get 10 new guys. And every year they're going to have to get 10 new guys and make a team out of those guys and then hope to win something. Okay. So, so what I said is you need two or three guys. It's basketball. If you give me two or three five stars, because there's only so much room in a basketball court, I don't need five of them. I need three guys. And this is you know, Wayne old school stuff. You give me a Kenny Anderson, uh, a Brian Oliver, and Scott from Georgia Tech, and two guys you never heard of, and they can go to the Final Four. And Florida State did it. That may be true. But what I'm talking about is, especially when you go into the portal, and especially when you recruit nowadays, there's some, for some reason, which I guess I sound like an old guy now too, for some reason there's some ex- expectation that I'm going to go to this new school and I'm going to be the guy. Because they went out and they got me. I was already the guy, like Fats Russell, he was already the guy somewhere else. So he's going to come to Maryland he's just going to be the guy on a bigger stage. And I think, well, going back to my example, they pulled it together again because this Turgeon rolling bus of pulling one guy, Sean Obi, out of the transfer portal at the last minute because they need another guy to fill up some minutes early season or something like that, hoping that they might turn out into the player they were once supposed to be. You just, you didn't, it just didn't work this time. The ball, when you look at this season as a whole, and I'm looking down the score list right now, the ball just didn't go in the basket one more time at this point. Look at Iowa. If the ball, if they had Cowan or, you know, if they even had the luck of those teams, they probably win that game. The okay. Illinois game, if they had a player that could really carry them, they would have won that game. But they pieced together this thing one more time, almost in the whole, like, Turgeon's leaving. This is it. They got to get it somewhere. Let's pull all in all these guys. And let's figure something out. Okay. And look, well, two, two questions. One is, does Wiggins, if Wiggins stays, is this, does this work? Well, does it work and is it better or are two different things? Do they win more games? So – I'll throw out the hypothetical scenario. Aaron Wiggins stays at Maryland. Maryland's pro- they were 20 preseason, or, or they were in the 20s range in the preseason. Well, when he was staying, they were in the top 10. Yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I was just going to say. Maybe they're 15 if Jess Wiggins stays and not more so. Are they living up to that expectation right now? No, I, I don't think they are. I think they probably are. They're 9-9 nine and nine right now. If Wiggins is here, they're probably – 13 and four. I was going to say 13 and whatever. I, I pretty or much 13, agree with that. Yeah, 13 okay. and five. But yeah. Question two. And I know we say we aren't going to go on for 40 minutes because try not to do that. You're Turgeon. You know the pressure. You know that Damon didn't want to give you the extension and he sort of got stuck in it. Don't you do every darn thing you can do to try, as you said, to get the bus to make one more trip here? I think that... From from my perspective, from reading what has come out of the program, I think that Bino, Morsell, Wiggins, some of the other assistants that, that were kind of teetering on the edge of not left, I think that everybody could tell what was going wrong here. And when you look at it, and you're you're still seeing some of these guys 
go out on Twitter and they're bought into, you know, what Turgeon was saying. And they're saying, you know, this is what Maryland kind of gets for this. There, there's a group of people out there like that. It's hard for me to look at this dead on and say that there wasn't some sense of this not going the right direction when a Maryland, Maryland's guy, Bino Branson, left the program. Why would he do that? If, money. Well, okay, you want to throw money out there. I think <laughs> Yeah, I that, do. It's a professional job. It you is get- a professional job, but he went – in my opinion, back well, definitely backwards in terms of what program he's involved with. And he has been like the guy at this program, the assistant coach for some time. And there, there is value in that. He's a, a Maryland guy. 12 years. He was here with Gary. And then he stayed yeah. with Mark. Yeah. And I just think when you start to see people say, are you in or are you out? And they're like, look, I got a job at, what was, is it DePaul? It's DePaul, DePaul. right? Yeah. I got a job offer at DePaul, and they're paying me X number of dollars more. Uh, I'm going to DePaul. I just don't think that that – I just cannot fathom that being all about money when this guy's been making, what, half a million to a million dollars for the last – you said he's been in Maryland for 12 years, so the last 10 or, or maybe eight because he probably started as the last assistant, which is still a high-paying job. But, you know, in, in all fairness to the argument, I, I really don't think that that's, that's all that was there. All right. Uh, Towards wrapping this up, although I think this one might be an entire hour. Uh, Kevin Sheehan, who we both know, friendly with Kevin Sheehan, been for a while known him, has Gary Williams on a couple weeks ago. Mm. And somehow Gary says, and this is a paraphrase, that he was thinking maybe they'd ask him to be the coach. And he would have liked to have done that. Do you buy into that, that Gary Williams would have coached this team? Do I buy into it? Is I he just think being that nice? the offer was, what'd you say? Or is he just being nice on the air going, yeah, it's Maryland. I would have loved to have done that. I think it's probably a mix of the two. You know, when, when a coach leaves there, there's always the, I believe belief that you can do two things. One is you can put the assistant coach in and maybe they'll get a little jolt like Danny Manning's talked about. And he said that that doesn't really exist in the college game, which I tend to disagree with pretty strongly. Um, God, I'd like to argue with that one too. I haven't seen a major college program do this shift. Like it's the NBA or the NHL where suddenly the guy, the number one well, guy is gone. Football. Yeah, but usually it's later or it's a complete disaster by then. Oh, yeah. did you say okay, complete disaster? Right. I don't really think it was a complete disaster when it when well, it all it was common. Man. But yeah. going back to what you had said, do I really think he would have done it? I think he might have tried, and I don't think his style resonates with the youth of today. I'll put it that way. It's, now, players like told my, me that before, and and I even saw this in my own sports playing career. There were people that had done things the more Gary Williams style where it was about discipline, doing it right, everybody being accountable. We're going to practice at six in the morning on a Saturday um, when, you know, nobody wants to be out there, but kind of, damn it, we're doing it. We're going out there. We're, we're, this is how it's done around here. And I've just seen it as I got into high school, which is now five, six years ago. And, and just kind of this turn with the, I don't know what you, whatever name people want to call it, the iPad generation doesn't really go for that. You had the older coach who had been very successful for a long time, and he left the program while you were there. And you left out some of the nice words a Gary Williams would have used in that. Because I've, I've seen a Gary Williams practice. Yeah, and and, 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 and I, man, I love that ferocity, but I also think you're I right. Do. It I wouldn't play today. texted me saying, you know, this is the worst they've been when you were alive today. Somebody actually told me that. Do you remember? I was actually like, do you remember when they were this bad? And I was like, no, they've never been this bad the entire time I've been alive. They've been bad or not good, but they have never been nine and nine. I don't think at this point of the season, one and six in the conference, absolute disaster going sideways. It's been but, 31 years, but, and I know we're up against the clock here. Everybody that was anybody that's been big in college basketball in the time that I've been alive. I, I was alive when Duke went two and fourteen or whatever in the ACC when Shashevsky missed. I was alive and remember when Dougherty took over the Carolina program and they went eight and twenty and they fired him. 
UCLA was horrible. Kentucky hired a, a guy that didn't fit after they had Tubby Smith and before they went back to either Patino or Calipari, uh, and they had to uh, abandon ship and start over. E- everybody who's any good has gone through this. The question is, and I saw this on Facebook, it'll be my, hopefully the last question tonight's segment, you can either say that Maryland's going to reload, which I think is absolute. You can get a Rick Patino type coach in here if you really wanted to and reload and probably be relevant almost immediately. Or you can end up being Georgia Tech. And, and Bobby Kremen took them to the Final Four, and then they come in with, uh, can't remember his name, they end up coaching George Mason later. Yeah, and he had Paul, Chris, Hewitt. Paul Hewitt. They had Chris Bosch at center to go to the Final Four. And I haven't seen them since. Goodbye, Georgia Tech. It's been 20 years. Which one is Maryland? Well, if there was a such thing as the middle, I would say that. But for argument's sake, I will say that Maryland will be back in, in this. Um, so tell me, give me that. We've got 18,000 seats and this place was built to win and there's no way in hell they're going to let well, this I thing. I think that there is that. But when you start to look at the facts... And Maryland oh, what? Facts get yesterday away. posted on Instagram like it was, I don't even, whatever it was, 19 years since they beat number one Duke in uh, Comcast Center. 2003. Yeah. Yeah. When you start posting stuff like that, I think you're on the way backwards. Because 2003 was a long, long time ago. For reference to all of our listeners, I was two when they played that game. So when we start relying on we were great when it was 2000 and it's 2022, I think that there's a bit of a problem here because while that was probably a great game and a great win for Maryland. Oh, it was. I was there. Yeah. You can throw something out there, but I almost feel like every day now I look on social media and today they're posting the Mellow Trimble ankle breaker against Michigan State. And yesterday they're posting something like they're trying to keep this alive with old memories to keep people engaged. They are old nothing memories. Good they're just memories, but that's okay. what we have. With memories to keep people engaged this year. And, you know, it's fine to go to that. I feel like we're leaning on that a lot now. And when you talk about being relevant and this place is built to win, and you look at the stadium that Maryland has, you look at the fans that Maryland has, it's clearly there. The pieces are there. It's a matter of somebody putting it together. But you can go down the list of every SEC football program and say that they all have that, and maybe one or two of them figure it out every 20 years. And I'm really starting to lean on the way of Maryland's like uh, Maryland's pretty equivalent to like Wisconsin football. They just can't not get through. And when you start to get in that loop, I feel like there's a lot of problems. Now, you're going to bring somebody in, whether it's, you know, the long list of people that are being considered for this position. And they're going to have to go out now and talk. They're going to have to get involved. And I'll take a really small example of that which is going on down here in Florida right now. Jacksonville realized their basketball program wasn't working and they wanted to commit to being better at basketball. So they went out and they got a young coach by the name of Jordan Mincy, who I think you're going to see on the big stage pretty quickly. He was an assistant at Florida. This year, before the other night, last night, they had the number one scoring defense in the country. And suddenly, the school's really engaged with the team. They got fans in the stadium. He's going out into the community and trying to bring money into the program. They're building a new practice facility. Really, I see it similar situation on the smaller scale as Maryland. There was absolutely nobody at the games before, but you go out and you get somebody that wants to be here and wants to be engaged with people and grew up in Maryland or knows about Maryland. He's going to go out there. He's going to shake hands with the donors. He's going to be friendly. I feel like, and I think you and I know this from personally, Turgeon never wanted to be that guy. Oh, no. But they need to get the Mike Young kind of Jordan Mincy coach in there that's going to engage with the media, know the people by name, and get get something energy-wise going in the situation. And I think you're right. I think that's what's needed. To me, I'll go as far as this first two, I'll give it two years. The first two years, if they're average, like they play some games against, I don't know, Michigan's number five, and they come in, there's 17,950 people in there. And Maryland is, whatever, 11 and nine in the conference and on the bubble. That's fine, as long as the coach re-engages the fan base. I think that's really what's on the edge of falling off the cliff here. Not the basketball that's played, but do people really care because we had somebody that really 
really did some damage here to the fans, and I don't think anybody really realized until it was over. I don't think it was intentional. I just think that he wasn't ever comfortable in this job, and neither was she. And there's a lot of you, – you got both of them. You got Ann and you got Mark. Really nice people, great people, just probably didn't belong here. And uh, But I'm not out to, to bash anybody, and we've, we've gone on longer than we promised. So – how bad does it get? Because we'll do this again over the weekend. How bad does it get on Friday night? I don't think it gets terrible. I, I think they kind of stay in the game. They'll teeter around with it for a while, and they'll probably just fall off in the second half, similar to the first time. The first time they played Illinois, though, they gave them a run for their money. They got foul trouble. I think what you and I have talked about this at length. You put your guards on the floor, maybe Reese plays center for some of the game, will have limited minutes, and – Drive and kick and drive and kick and drive and kick. You, that, that's you all you can do. It's really out. simple basketball. You make number 21 for them, Kofi Coburn, cover Scott 20 feet from the basket and make him foul him. Get him out of the game, make it an average game, and you got a shot. One of these days, you're going to get Fats, Ayala, and Scott hot on the same night, and you go, why can't this happen all the time? Hopefully, it's Friday night. And with that, I think that's a good place to leave it for this episode of the Young Turfs podcast. As always, Wayne, thanks for joining us. Uh, you've done a great job being our editor in chief for uh, the last couple of years. We're going to change the podcast up. We got more coming uh, about the changes that we're going to make to this show with Jack over the weekend. I just talked to him. He's out on vacation. He'll be back uh, this weekend and we'll kind of let you know uh, how we're going to try and keep these shows a little bit cut down in time, even though this one didn't work out like that. But as always, thanks for listening.